happens. I think that in future years, people will look back on this time as one of total shame for academia. The very people in academia who should have been leading the charge to question what governments were telling us and to pursue the truth have actually been the ones most prominent in censoring any attempts to pursue the truth. I mean, it's been largely academics who pushed the government into the extreme restrictions and lockdowns. And often these academics are not even qualified in the relevant areas and they don't provide any rigorous evidence for the recommendations they made. I mean, these include, um, for example, psychologists who were prominent in promoting the, what I regard as what was a psyops propaganda, the campaign of fear, which is well documented. It's in the you know minutes of the uh, of the of the sage meetings, etc., which were basically you know a campaign to force people to comply with increasingly harsh restrictions and infringements of civil liberties, and then to close down any any dissent against that. And joined today by Professor Norman Fenton of Queen Mary University in London. Professor Fenton gained his PhD in mathematics at Sheffield University and he's been a fellow of the Turing Institute, a visiting lecturer at University College London, affiliated professor to the University of Haifa and he's the author of at least four books and countless papers. So actually I did manage to count them, I think there's 385 of them in total. They've been focusing on critical decision making in law and health and security and many other subjects too. He's also been an expert witness in major criminal and civil cases and he's also um, welcome to this particular podcast here today. So Norman Fenton, thank you very much for appearing with us today. Thanks. I should just say that my, my main academic post is as a professor at Queen Mary University of London. Yes, I, I, I thought I'd caught that at the beginning, but um, you, good, good to mention it. Okay. Um, Norman, some of your recent work has centred now on COVID and you've been looking at data and the use of data. I've got a couple of papers which I've been looking at here. There's um, what proportion of, of people are, uh, do not get symptoms of COVID and paradoxes in the reporting of COVID vaccine effectiveness. And what what is it that we know about covid statistics and what do we not know can we actually pin down um things like do we actually know how many people have died from covid or do we not those kind of st basic statistics do we do we have that information available well the simple answer to these questions is, is, is no and it's all because of the problems of what a case really means so there's these two measures that are commonly spoken about, the case fatality rate, which is the percentage of deaths amongst the confirmed cases uh, of the virus. And there's the uh, infection fatality rate, which is the percentage of deaths amongst those infected with the virus, irrespective of whether they've been counted as a confirmed case. Now, the problem is that there's no gold standard test for the virus and a so-called confirmed test is simply defined as a person testing positive once with a PCR test, and that's not an accurate test. And moreover, the more people you test, the more so-called cases you'll find, even if there's nothing wrong with them. Now, there's also the massive problem whereby people who die of a cause unrelated to COVID, but with a recent positive PCR test, are generally classified as a COVID death. So, uh, early on in the pandemic, the only people getting PCR tests were those already seriously ill with symptoms. So because quite a lot of those people died, the case fatality rate was very high. And people assumed this meant the, inf the infection fatality rate was high. Now, as more people who were infected but not seriously ill with the virus were tested, both the case fatality rate and the estimated infection fatality rate came down. They should actually eventually emerge as far as uh, converge. Now, as far as what do we know about these rates? Well, the most rigorous estimates of the inf infection fatality rates are done by John Ioannidis at Stanford University. And there are massive national and regional differences, but there are obviously also massive differences among different age groups and people with comorbidities. Now he estimates internationally a median in infection fatality rate of 0.2%. So on average, overall, uh, out of every 1,000 people who get the virus, about two will die from it. 
i.e. one in 500. But of course, for people under 20, that figure is several orders of magnitude lower. And while for people over 80, it's at least 10 times higher. Now, obviously, with improved treatments and hopefully the vaccine, these rates will decrease. As far as the UK is concerned, um, the, I just looked at the, the statistics yesterday. They're now showing nearly 10 million cases since the start, of whom 100, about 100, just over 140,000 have died. So officially, the case fatality rate in the UK is about 1.4%, which is seven times higher than Ioannidis' infection fatality rate estimate. But of course, many deaths occurred at the start when only the seriously ill were classified as cases. So the, the basic question is we do or, or we don't know how many people have died from um, COVID? Well, um, this gets us on to, the, I guess, the issue of kind of like excess deaths and whether that um, can be used because some have argued, some have argued that the only, um, you know, the, the most reliable way to, to, to get the, the number of died directly because of COVID is to look at, um, look at e excess deaths, but there, there are actually problems with that. Um, I mean, the most obvious is that the lockdowns and restrictions which were intended to stop COVID are themselves leading to excess deaths. I mean, so for example, we know that um, lack of access, access to early cancer diagnosis because of lockdowns is causing um, excess cancer deaths, while you know, the general difficulty of accessing hospital services is leading to increased deaths from heart failure and other chronic conditions. And I think there's also evidence that, that, that there's been an increase in suicides in the last 18 months. So the problem is unless the true cause of each death is properly classified, we may never know whether COVID or the lockdowns have caused most excess deaths, assuming there are an excess of deaths. There's also a statistical concern I have about this whole emphasis on uh, excess deaths, and, that, and that's that there are actually lots of subjective assumptions that have to be made in determining whether or not there is an excess of deaths during any specific period of time, taking account of all of the various factors that can contribute to that. I have to say that if what you say is right, then, you know, the um, excess deaths could be caused by the intervention um, yeah. rather than by the illness itself. It's a huge irony then, isn't it, that, um, you know, our, our attempt to deal with the COVID issue has actually produced a worse situation than it would have done if it, if it had been just allowed to run by itself, if that's the case, that is. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I, I have quite strong personal views about um, about the uh, you know the, the interventions, the lockdowns, and restrictions. Um, you know, for various reasons. Uh, you know, th this is something that I was opposed to on on, on you know on grounds not just of you know restrictions on on civil liberties. Um, but yeah, I mean that's something that we can you know, we can talk about later. But yeah, that there is that's that's uh, that is a major concern that that is happening. Okay, so just just to to come back again, they, we don't actually have an accurate figure for how many people have actually died from COVID. Is that right? We we have this this dual system of dying from COVID and dying with COVID, and that's kind of muddied the waters a bit. Is that right? That, that's right. So you've got so they've got the two uncertainties involved here. One is uh, what proportion of those deaths which were classified as COVID deaths because of a positive PCR test within 28 days of death were caused by the virus itself rather than by something completely unrelated to the virus. And you've got the issue of whether even whether or not the uh, the, the PCR test um, positive result was a, a, an accurate indicator that they even had the virus so you've got those two massive causes uh, of uncertainty in the in the, in the death in in the uh, account of the number of deaths attributed to, to to covid would it have been possible to have pinned down the, the the number of deaths more accurately if we'd have chosen a different definition or is it just that we're in the situation that we can't be more accurate well i mean it, this is they're saying weird, isn't there? Because um, 
if you think about what happened with sort of previous respiratory viruses, um, having the disease associated with the virus actually meant by definition that you had to have symptoms. Now, this whole thing about SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus, and COVID-19, which is the disease, in previous, you know, in previous uh, years, the disease, which is actually COVID-19, you know, you, you, to, to have that, you're supposed to have symptoms. So this whole idea about, you know, the, the asymptomatic, so ha having uh, um, uh, COVID is a kind of, kind of like um, a misnomer. So you've already got that problem. You've got that problem of classification there. Yes, I, I'm, I think you've you've really um, spoken about this in one of your papers. What proportion of people with COVID-19 do not get symptoms? And I think you refer to the fact, and I've heard it myself on, on government adverts on the, uh, on the radio and on the television, mm -hmm. that one in three people with COVID do not get symptoms. Mm. Yeah, this is, this is um, I mean, we expose this as, 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 as a, you know, we, we, we looked at this in depth. But see, the problem is that what, when they say that message, because what they actually are, are saying, what it actually means is that one in three people who test positive with a PCR test have no symptoms. That, and that is true, actually, at times when the infection rate is, is lower than, than it was when they were saying that, it's actually a higher proportion of people who test positive have for COVID had no symptoms, right? But that's very different, you know, because of this, this, this um, fuzzy distinction between the virus and the disease, um, it, it, it kind of like doesn't, it, 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 it's kind of like meaningless, but it is something that we've researched quite deeply. And the problem is that because so many asymptomatic people, i.e. people without systems are tested, and because of the false positive problems for such people, we believe that the true proportion of people with COVID who do not get symptoms, even if that's meaningful, is more likely to be about one in 19 than one in three. The one in three refers specifically to people testing positive with a PCR test, which we think is, doesn't really mean much, well, it doesn't mean anything at all when you're testing a lot of asymptomatic people. So let's get this clear. So um, if you're testing people who have symptoms, so, sorry, if, if you're testing people who who have, um, well, they must be, I suppose, symptoms uh, of COVID, one in, one in three of them. Um, no, I haven't got this right. Can no, I? if you're testing, I haven't said, I'm just focusing on people without symptoms because actually most people get in, when we had this mass surge in PCR testing, which started in September 2020, most people um, who are getting the PCR tests are actually have no symptoms at all. They're not ill. And you get all of the people having to take PCR tests for travel and for work and all those things. These people are not ill. They don't have any symptoms. They're just having to get the PCR test because that's what they've been instructed to do. And those people, a lot of them are testing, well, a lot of those who are testing positive, and I'm going into more details about how we know this, are actually, uh, don't, don't, don't have the virus at all. In fact, they, you know, they, they, they're actually false positives, okay? So you've got that problem. But in a sense, I'm just thinking back, trying to clarify what I was saying before about your, your question about, do we really know how many? Is there any way of knowing how many really have had the, um, the the virus. So of course, the thing is, if you go by if if we adopted you know the previous approaches to judging whether people you know had a disease or not, it's all about whether they're ill with symptoms, right? The fact that we're putting into these case numbers, these so-called confirmed cases, all of these people who were never who not only didn't have symptoms at the time they were tested, but never developed symptoms at all. Um, and therefore were never ill, and, and as many people would argue, very, very unlikely, in fact, almost impossible to transmit the virus without um, symptoms, then you've got this problem that we really, you know, if we'd have focused only on those who were genuinely ill with the symptoms of, of, of COVID, and we know what they are, we know COVID is real. I mean, I've had COVID, I know it's a, it's a, it's a horrible thing to have, yeah. right? But you know, if you've, if you've got it, but you know you've got it. Right. So why couldn't we rely on people's the judgment of, of, of people and clinicians in assessing how well a person was? So that's the that's the that's the it could have easily been done, but it wasn't done that way. OK, so in other words, the, the issue really revolves around the idea of 
mass testing of everybody. That's yes. where the, the problem has arisen. Is that right? That is that I regard as the. It's, it's interesting because it, I regard that as the, the the biggest problem of all. And it's, it's, it's interesting here because right at the beginning, when we, in our initial research, right as I indicated, because so few people were being because the only people who were being confirmed as positive of PCR tests were people who were already seriously ill with the disease. And therefore quite a lot of those actually died. You get this very high proportion of this higher case fatality rate. We were arguing that there should have been a lot more random testing of people who, who didn't have symptoms. So we were kind of arguing in favor of what the government later adopted. But we quickly, at that point, we didn't realize the problems of how inaccurate the tests were. OK, so it's ironic that we were in our early work, we were sort of saying this, this would be a good thing to do if you wanted to get a better understanding of the true uh, nature of the virus in terms of the true infection rate, etc. Right. But of course, when it, when the mass testing actually, you know, was rolled out and then we started to discover the problems with the false positives, then I realized that this was essentially a catastrophic error to have this mass testing of asymptomatic people. So the, the PCR test um, has a degree of accuracy, but we have some false positives, possibly false negatives as well, I should suppose. Mm. But have we got any understanding of what the rate of false positives would be on that test, or, or do we not know that either? Okay, this is, of course, something that we've looked at in a lot of detail. So there isn't a consensus on these false positive or in false negative rates. And that's because there are so many sources of potential errors. So for example, different labs run the tests at different cycle thresholds. And it's known that if you increase the cycle threshold, you increase the probability of a false positive. And there was also, so that's, that's one of the biggest ones. There was quite a long period also we discovered in the UK um, uh, in 2020 when the lighthouse labs were reporting positives on just one gene when by the guidelines of the kit manufacturers, such outcomes should have been reported as negative. And at one point there was many as 40% of the positives simply because of that failed um, approach to interpreting the test results, which should have been, which were essentially false positives. And there's also of course, multiple potential causes of false positives through things like contamination and poor lab procedures. But interestingly, something which never gets discussed is that the biggest cause of difference in whether or not, I mean, the biggest, the biggest, sorry, the biggest cause of differences in false positive rates is simply whether or not a person gets a confirmatory test, i.e. a follow-up positive before being confirmed positive. So, for example, if the false positive rate was 2%, i.e. there's a 2% chance of getting a positive test if you don't have the virus on any single test. If you then do a follow-up test and you only confirm it if the follow-up test is also positive, then that 2% false positive rate jumps right down to 0.04%. And the problem is that confirmatory testing is almost never performed. Right. So you've always got this higher, you know, even though people might say, oh, well, we'll confirm it. And therefore, the true false positive rate, you know, is incredibly low, which it would be if you did confirmatory testing. It's not done. Now, the, the, the beauty, I want to say the beauty here is that it just so happens that a Cambridge University study of asymptomatic students actually gave us very hard evidence about the false rates for asymptomatics under conditions of rigorous testing. So. In that study, just over 10,000 PCR samples were tested. These are asymptomatic, these are all people who are asymptomatic. That's why it's so interesting. So 10,000 PCR samples of asymptomatics were tested, of which 43 were positive. Right? Now, all 43 of those were then subject to confirmatory testing. And it turned out that only six were confirmed. Now, assuming that confirmatory test results you know, were correct and assuming no significant false negatives, then that means that out of about 10,000 non-COVID 
samples, 36 were false positives. So the false positive rate is quite low, but that's not the thing that's of interest. What we're really interested in is the probability that a person testing positive really is positive. And of course, we know that 36 of the 43 positive test results, which is over 80%, were false positives. So outside of that study, we know that confirmatory testing is almost never done. And that actually means that we can conclude that most positive PCR test results in people who are asymptomatic, i.e. who don't have symptoms, are actually false positives. And that and that's an absolutely phenomenal result, which people just don't seem to realize. I mean, you get this confusion. People will say, oh, that's nonsense because we know the false positive rate is less than 1%. It's less than half a percent. Yes, that's true, right? But that doesn't matter. What matters is the percentage of people who are asymptomatic, who are testing positive, how many of those, what proportion of those are genuine positives? And it turns out there's, it's, it's very few. That's astonishing, really, isn't it, Don? It is. And, and what, what implication should that have for for governments then? If they, uh, they, should, they should stop mass testing of asymptomatic people. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And testing only those people who are symptomatic then, presumably. Exactly. Yeah. And then and then even there, as I said, pe people who've got the symptoms, you know, you know, that there's this, there's this, is there this, this window when you're pre-symptomatic? That's that's the thing. I mean, actually that one in nineteen that we came up with might have been indicative of 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 the sort of the pre-symptomatic i think it's actually much you know much less than that if you're mass testing asymptomatics but yeah you know, so, but yeah in general people know you know people know when they're people know when they're ill and actually know when they're ill with covid as well okay now, can i can i move on to to look at um another area which has been influencing the way mm. in which society and government has approached this and that's the use of models which have been mm -hmm. provided by various academic institutions particularly imperial college has um has been right at the forefront of putting forward um models of, of covid um how how do you view those kind of models how how useful are they in in determining how we should respond to to a, a pandemic like this look I can't be too critical of the kind of models provided because most of our, our research revolves around building probabilistic models to predict uncertain outcomes. And that's essentially what the models provided by Imperial do. And moreover, their models, like ours, have to be able to incorporate fairly limited historical data with a lot of so-called expert knowledge. And much of that is subjective. Now, a lot of people criticize that, okay? But I see that as absolutely necessary. The big difference between, you know, what we think is sense, let's say, you know, the kind of modeling that, 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 that should be done and what they're doing is that our models are much more big picture causal models where we use Bayesian inference to both update the predictions as new data observed, is observed are observed and also to provide explanations for why a particular data are observed. Now, in contrast, the imperial models are what are called sort of stochastic simulation models. They're trying to model the entire population, sort of each individual, each individual and each individual household. You can think of it as something like a, a computer game like SimCity without the graphics. So in addition to modeling each person and, and household, the models have hundreds of variables, some of which if changed will produce completely different outcomes. So obviously there's garbage in, garbage out problem, but that's the same with all models. I mean, I, I would argue that our Bayesian models would inevitably produce much wider confidence intervals than, than those of Imperial. And it's also important to know about, about their models is that much of the computer code that runs that, that, that model it is very old. Now, I, I've never inspected that code myself, but let's say some people I trust have and, and have criticized it for being poorly maintained and buggy but that's 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 that you know i'll, I'll say that, that that's that's hearsay that's not my that's not based on my my own judgment of the of the models okay but um the criticism is that um again it depends upon the various parameters which you set or the uh, the assumptions mm -hmm. which you make how do you assure yourself that the assumptions are appropriate for, for well, the well, the, the big look, the big prop, the obvious problem with the with the imperial models, as as far as I can tell, is that 
as in previous viruses, when they got their estimates wrong, it was the key parameters that they got wrong. In particular, the infection rate, i.e. how easily transmittable was the virus, and the infection fatality rate were overestimated. And they also underestimated natural immunity to the virus. So those three, when you get those three uh, parameters wrong, you're going to get massively wrong, you know, exaggerated predictions of the um, of the of the number of people who are going to die by from it, and also how quickly how quickly they're going to die. So you know that they are basically overestimating the danger yeah. of the virus. I mean, people remember the prediction they said 500,000 deaths without interventions, you know, and, and quite quickly. Because that's the thing, the key point was their emphasis on the speed with which it would happen. And so that's what gave rise to the narrative that the hospitals would very quickly be unable to cope. And it was that that drove the demand for lockdowns. And the thing is that the imperial model explicitly incorporated different lockdown scenarios. But the assumptions encoded into those weren't based on any relevant empirical data because such large scale lockdowns had never happened in Western nations before. And also, I mean, th th their models never considered the costs of lockdowns, only the supposed benefits. So the model exaggerated the danger of the virus and the effectiveness of lockdowns in halting the spread. But it was quickly presented as the only way to stop hundreds of thousands of people dying fairly quickly and the hospitals being overrun. Hmm. You, you mentioned that um, the models didn't include any of the um, uh, the the costs involved in in these interventions that it, it did model you know the, the downside of, of the virus but not the downside of the intervention has, has that been a, a a serious weakness or is that not possible to include in in models properly i mean have you come across any models which do a kind of a cost benefit analysis rather than just looking at one side of the equation yeah, I have actually seen there are there have been several academic papers from health economists that do this, and they generally come to the conclusion the benefits could never have possibly exceeded the risks. Um, mm. So while it's impossible to, to be certain, I, I don't believe the UK government or any other Western government have ever seriously considered such models, at least not until too late. I mean, it's a massively complex modeling problem. But when you just simply list the advantages and disadvantages of lockdowns, I mean, it's impossible to conclude lockdowns. I mean, I've just, I'm just trying to think, maybe I can uh, share a, a, a graphic at this point. No, go ahead. Let's just see if I can do this. Um, is that working? It's just about to come up, I think. It must be a sizable file. It says you're about to start sharing your screen. And there it is, yes. Yeah, so I mean, I put together, I mean, you could think of this as a very, very simple model for the cost benefits, but of course we haven't, I mean, we did a little bit of work trying to quantify this. I mean, this is what we was, what we were saying was that, you know, this is what the government should be doing. So you've got kind of like, these are the obvious costs, the risks, right? You've got some benefits over here, right, of course, but the size of the, you know, the, the size of the boxes here indicates the, the, the overall, you know, the larger the box, the larger the cost or benefit and the darker the colors, you know, the longer, uh, the, the, sort of the longer term effects. You've got all these things like, you know, all of the reduced quality of education associated with lockdowns. As I mentioned, the canceled treatments for um, cancer and other diseases, reduced access to non-critical health services. You know, you're devastating the economy you know, tourist entry, arts and that. And of course you get this massive government spending and debt, future pensions are at risk, you know, devastating increased future taxes, mass unemployment and all the, the kind of like the, the, the social uh, impact over here, um, which leads to kind of like the, the loss of civil liberties, which of course is, is, is happening, increased violence, etc. So, I mean, I'll, I'll stop the, the share at this point. That looks like a Bayesian kind of model. Is that your one? It, it, it is. It's not very, but it, it, it's a kind of a causal model. I mean, it could. I mean, we were hoping to do a, a, a Bayesian model along those lines, but there's a lot of work in getting all the relevant data involved in that. But the thing is, I say, just I don't think. I mean, just it just to me, it just makes logical, you know, logical sense that that that, that the you know the risks, you know, the, the disadvantages outweigh the advantages. 
Yeah. It's surprising that that hasn't been taken into account then. You'd think that someone who's going to make a massive intervention would look at the, the downside of that. And um, I'm continually surprised it hasn't. Yeah. Um, so can I, can I move on then to look at um, some of the statistics that we're now getting from the, the vaccine or the use of the vaccine? Yeah, maybe so just, I, I think there's, a, there's an important point actually about, about yeah. which we just before we get onto that, following on from that point about why, why was, why weren't they, you know, why didn't they consider this, this, this collateral damage, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the intervention, because I think this is important, right? Because this kind of like informs a lot of the, um, a lot of, let's say the narrative. I mean, I think the politicians were so, were so scared and were so taken in by those, you know, those academic models, imperial models, etc. And the people proposing those, I think they didn't want to be accused of ignoring the advice and having blood on their hands. And I think that there were lots of other political forces that maybe coalesced on the ideas that lockdowns, you know, were, were such a good idea that it'd be the only idea that, that there was no point in considering anything else. And um, I think there are, yeah, there, there are political, uh, let's say, uh, um, forces behind that. I mean, which are which are very curious. We had this. Um, you know, all of the main influencers, um, you know, who, who were involved in, uh, there, there, was a, there was a simulation event, a so-called event 201, which was held in October 2019, which was a simulation of a SARS virus from China. And that it was at that event, and many, I say, many of the key influencers who made the decisions for the, the real, for, for, for COVID, were at that event. And most of the measures, you'll find that most of the, the lockdowns, the, the kind of like the PSYOPs, measures on you know the, the way to in, install fear into the population about how dangerous the virus is through kind of like media censorship and the likes they that was actually that was that was game those were the those were the the proposals to 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 halt the spread of the virus in, in that in that simulation and i think that this was just accepted it just became i mean it's curious as to the timing of that but it did you know, it, it did become sort of accepted as, you know, a means, in fact, even an opportunity, you know, it, uh, they talk about the Great Reset, you know, that they saw this as an opportunity effectively to sort of almost cleanse society. And you've got this, you know, this whole, it fits into this now, this build back better mantra. Um, yeah, and it, it also fits into the the idea that, that lockdowns and that kind of like minimizing international travel and other unnecessary travel also fits into the kind of like the climate change narrative that this is good for the climate etc so yeah i think that all of that all of that is <laughs> is part of the reason why these things you know why somehow it was the lockdowns which were the only real solution to the problem that that, that how that became adopted it's hard to do all of that without counting the costs isn't it you'd think that would be absolutely essential to um, any decision. Well, you, you, you'd think that, but you know, when there are, as I say, when there are many world leaders who all see this as, as the, the opportunity for the Great Reset, then you know they're they're thinking about thinking about it as sort of a different sort of you know a meta level of benefit that that us mortals don't know anything about. All right, come come on now to the the vaccine statistics yeah. because the, we've now had quite a. Uh, a reasonable period of time now since vaccines have been introduced to to our society and um the the phe uh, stats are showing the phe public health england now rechristened um uh, uk health security agency i think it is um now show that there are more cases per hundred thousand people uh, of covid amongst the vaccinated than amongst the unvaccinated is there any comment you can make on that? Actually, I'm just going to show their slide, the, the, the data from that latest UK HSA report. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So actually, this is, I took this on website, but actually I've done, we did the, we, we came up with the um, the same, exactly the same graph, just using their data in, in one of their tables. And so what this is showing is this was cases per, 100k can you see yeah I mean, you can see the vaccinated and unvaccinated here so the um what you can see is that in all each of the age groups from 30 above the number of cases per 100k amongst the vaccinated 
is higher than the unvaccinated. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop sharing that. That's that's that. I'm not, I'm not commenting on the accurate. I won't comment yet on the accuracy of that data. Now, the thing is that um, this caused an enormous stir, right? When this report came out, and there were prominent statisticians like Professor um, David Spiegelhalter who voiced great anger about this, saying that it was misinformation which would be exploited by anti-vax conspiracy theorists. And his argument is that the report relies on population statistics, which are provided by um, NIMS, which is the National Immunology Management Services, which he claims are biased and unreliable. He said they should be using the ONS, the Office for National Statistics Population Statistics, yes. instead. Now, now, we did an analysis of both the NIMS and ONS population estimates for number of vaxxed and unvaxxed, and we found that there were fundamental bias in, and inconsistencies in both. So the notion that the results of vax efficiency based on the NIMS data are totally unreliable, while those based on the ONS data are totally reliable, are, are laughable. Yeah. I mean, the fact is that many... What, what we know is that many of the most vaccinated places on earth now do seem to be the ones with some of the highest current infection rates. Now we don't know, um, we don't, you know, it's difficult to really interpret that, but it does seem to suggest that this UK HSA or Public Health England say report, you know, maybe wasn't too wrong. The, the, certainly what we know is that the, the idea that the vaccination, the vaccination is or was 95% effective is simply not supported by any current real world data. So the problem is that the studies which supposedly showed all of this had fundamental flaws. So for example, there was a massive observational study of the Pfizer vaccine in Israel, which was supposedly, you know, over 4 million people uh, in that observational study, which supposedly showed that the study was 95% effective in stopping uh, COVID infections. But it had many flaws, including, again, this comes back to the same problem about case numbers, including it was only unvaccinated people who were regularly required to get a PCR test. And so many of the unvaxxed cases would have been false positive asymptomatics, and you wouldn't have seen those amongst the vaccinated. So it, it, it completely biases the, it biases the numbers. Hmm. So that's, I mean, but, but we're only talking here about about case numbers and, and and not the impact on you know on serious illness or death, of course. So so what is the um, what is the conclusion from from that? The fact that you do have, according to the PHE data, the more people who are vaccinated having the catching the illness now per hundred thousand. Well, of course, as I say, there, there there are people who there are people who dispute that, which is why. You know, our view is that the only the only true way to you know to measure um, the overall effectiveness, let's say, of, of the vaccine, is over a longer period. Um, you know, to, to to see whether what you know what we call is the, the sort of the all cause mortality comparison is the one, but whereby sorry, it's, yeah, it's it's to look at over long term whether the whether the vaccine is effectively saving more people. From not getting the virus, then it's then it's let's say killing people from it and adverse reactions. That's to, uh, to us that that's you know that that's the only that's the that's the ultimate simple measure of of the the, the effectiveness of of the vaccine. So so the idea I mean that, uh, the idea is that um, if the if if COVID is as dangerous as claimed, and if the vaccine is as effective as claimed, then we should be seeing many more COVID related deaths. In the unvaccinated than the vaccinated in each age group but on the other hand if the vaccine is as safe as claims there should be very very few more deaths from causes unrelated to covid among the vaccinated than the unvaccinated in each age group so when you add up the covid and non-covid deaths i.e when we consider the all cause the count of all cause deaths the mortality rate should be higher among the unvaccinated than the vaccinated confirming the benefits of vaccination outweigh the risk. And that's what we think, you know, I, I, that's why I think all of these, I don't, I don't, to tell the truth, I don't, I don't really, I don't 
put that much trust in those that that you can, you know in a sense you know david spiegelholder said oh it's it's all nonsense well i i i don't i'm not so saying it's nonsense i think it's it's all unreliable because it's all based on case this, this idea of covid cases and no we, ca we can't rely on that to do anything we have to ultimately for the certainly for the vaccine look at deaths right because deaths are certain right mm -hmm. and in theory we can we can determine um and what's more deaths of all cause mortality deaths that you know i not taken account of whether it was covid or, or whatever it was is, is certainly indisputable and also what's what shouldn't be indisputable is whether or not a person had at least one dose of the vaccine before they died right so simply looking at the comparison all cause deaths whether they were vaccinated or not were vaccinated means at least one jab that is the ultimate uh, measure of you know of the effectiveness of the vaccine and the, the the problem is that you know that's what we're looking at that's what we're that's what we've been focusing on for for, for the last couple of months and and what we're seeing is um well, you could say evidence which sort of you know supports well let's just say that we're not seeing evidence <laughs> that supports the idea that the vaccines are necessarily safe and effective right okay so at the moment that the the the, the, the question is out on or, or, or the issue is out on on the the matter of that particular data from PAG and the best thing to do is to wait until we've got all cause data or excess um, data excess deaths data is that right that, that's right. And now, um, so there's, first of all, there's on, on that, there is, um, th th there's the, the so-called the vaccine adverse effect, uh, vaccine, you know, serious adverse reaction reporting system, you know, where, where people report uh, whether they're adverse deaths, you know, and, and serious adverse reactions to the virus. There's, there's sort of data on that. And we've done a lot of work on that. I mean, it's, you know, there certainly are you know, an order of magnitude increase um, in the number of reported uh, deaths and serious adverse reactions from the vaccine compared with, you know, pre all previous uh, vaccines combined, you know, but there's, in a sense, even that's kind of like inconclusive. We, we, we want to see the direct comparison. So there was the, the first, the first indication actually that, that, that maybe you know, there might be some, it might not be as effective as claim as actually from the Pfizer randomized controlled trial, because there were 40,000 participants, I think on that, right? Equally split between the two arms of the vaccine and the placebo. And, and as I understand it, the current, the latest data on all cause mortality from that is that 21 people in the vaccination arm have died compared to a simply dispute it's either 16 or 17 in the placebo arm now that's not statistically significant mm. but as a kind of like an empirical observation it doesn't exactly provide support for the overall cost benefit of the vax so we basically um wanted to get the hard data from you know from, from the uk because they were the ons to their credit were started to publish these um uh, vaccine mortality report the, 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 sorry the mortality reports by vaccination status which is basically what I'm saying that we need okay and initially initially the problem is if you don't do that by age category if you just if you just if you just simply look at the whole population all of the deaths and simply look at the proportion of um, vaccinated to unvaccinated in that it is inevitable that it will look like the mortality rate is much higher in the vaccinated than the unvaccinated but that's a statistical quirk right that's simply because the vast majority of old or most of the deaths occur in the old and the vast majority of the old are, are vaccinated yeah whereas many you know where the deaths don't occur in the young that's where the west that's where people you know there's a much lower proportion of vaccinated people you're not seeing deaths so you absolutely it's critical that if you're going to use this all-cause mortality comparison with the vax and the unvax you've got to have it age categorized and as a result of an of a, of a freedom of information request and also direct communications with the ons which we so so we we you know, we asked for this basically, and in their most recent report, they did provide 
the age categorized data. However, while the older age categories were fine, they had 60 to 69, 70 to 79, and 80 plus, all of the rest, which was the 10 to, 10 to 59, was in one bucket. So what you saw was that in this big group, the 10 to 59s, again, you saw that the all-cause mortality was much higher in the vaccinated than the unvaccinated. But again, that's likely to be confounded by age. Mm. And in fact, in each of the older age categories, the all-cause mortality was lower in the vaccinated, which is promising. The problem is that we've identified statistical issues, which, suggest, which actually suggest that that there must be misclassification going on and also underestimation of the proportion of unvaxxed. And once reasonable estimates of the necessary adjustments of these are made, are made the, the longer term, you know, all cause mortality, you know, the weekly rates of those for the vaxxed and the unvaxxed actually look pretty similar. And in fact, there seems to have been a sharp increase in the, uh, in the, all cause mortality of the VAX shortly after the, the VAX program was, was at its peak rollout. So you still would like the, the, uh, the finer grain detail? On yeah, the, yeah. We, we need that more fine grain detail to be able to, especially in that, I mean, it's critical in that 10 to 59 age group. Any sign that they're going to provide that for you or there's some reason why they can't provide it? The reason they can't, the, 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 the official reason they can't is because that when you're measuring these on a weekly basis, if you've got categories like 10 to 20, 29, 20, sorry, 20 to 29, et cetera, yeah. there are so few, because they're also distinguishing COVID and non-COVID deaths, there are so few COVID deaths, and in some weeks, so few all-cause mortality deaths that, that it can de-anonymize the data. So you'll see like zeros and ones, and where you yeah. see a one, so, you know, if, if, in, if in one particular week, there was just one, death of a person aged between 20 and 19 and you know that is and you kind of like know now we our view is there's no need for them to do it in weeks we, we'd actually prefer this to be say in months actually right where you wouldn't have that problem so these problems are certainly not insurmountable and um uh i don't know what i mean as i say I, I we we need that data we need that data because you know how can we make look if you looked at, as I say, if you just looked at their, the, the raw data they're providing, then the message moment is vaccinate people. It makes sense to vaccinate people over 60, but it doesn't make sense to vaccinate people under, under 60, right? Well, that may or may not be the case. We need to have the, you know, we need to have the, 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 the more um, fine grain categorization to be able to, you know, to be able to make these, 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 these informed decisions. That's what it's all about. Yes. In in terms of um, the, the vaccine statistics, is, um, is there any data on the, the transmissibility of the, the virus if you've been vaccinated as opposed to if you haven't been vaccinated? Because that's quite a different matter as to your, your vulnerability, isn't it? What, what, is, what is, again, this is not, because this, touches, because this touches on areas where I think you need sort of some clinical, uh, you know, knowledge of Im immunology we, we, we not rather than just relying on the statistics there it's, it's not something we've looked at but what is clear is that if you just look at heavily vaccinated you know areas and, and where, where you've got you know close to 100 percent uh vaccination it's clear that the the virus is is definitely <laughs> still transmissible by virus by um by um vaccinated people there is there surely nobody is doubting that anymore but this is an important issue because many countries are now operating a kind of a a, a, a different approach to those who are vaccinated and those who are unvaccinated there's the introduction of possible covid covid passports here in this country yep. in austria they've recently introduced a lockdown situation but only for the unvaccinated and presumably this is on the basis that the unvaccinated are more dangerous more able yeah. to transmit the illness yeah and, and and there just doesn't seem to be evidence for that i mean it's it it, it this the, you know that whole idea of the, the vaccine mandates passports i mean I, i'm personally appalled by them you know not just because of the, you know, the the social reasons but i mean just you know as i say medically i'm not a clinician but it it, it does appear from the empirical data that the vaccines you know, don't stop infection or spread. 
right? And, and, and even if they did, surely the only people at risk would be those who choose to be unvaccinated. So it is both discriminatory and an infringement of, of people's sort of medical autonomy. Yeah, that's something you would uh, support then. Mm. Um, have you done any uh, any work on um, the statistical treatment of, of, uh, sorry, the treatment of the illness rather than just uh, the vaccines? Yes, um, we have done a bit here because um, there's, there was this big, there's, and it's, there's this ongoing um, debate about um, uh, an antiparasitic, a very safe and commonly used antiparasitic um, drug called ivermectin, which has been claimed to be um, effective when given early to people. Um, if, you, if you treat uh, COVID early, that can have um, a major impact on, on reducing the risk of death, right? Well, we were intrigued to discover that there are two meta-analyses which looked at the same set of published randomized controlled trials about this, came to opposite conclusions. Yeah. Even though the statistical results in both were essentially the same. They both showed that the early use of, of, of ivermectin reduced the risk of death in infected patients by around 80%. Now the papers, con the conclusions of the paper that said that this provided no support for ivermectin were actually based on a somewhat vague and possibly biased subjective assessment of the quality of the trials themselves. And they, we believe, erroneously concluded that, the, that, the, of, that their conclusion of no effect, whereas it was merely a weaker evidence of a positive effect. And because of because actually we think there are weaknesses in the traditional statistical approaches to both meta-analysis, in fact, to meta-analysis in general, we think you know, a Bayesian approach is better. We actually did a thorough Bayesian analysis using the same studies that those meta-analysis, we, we looked at the same set of randomized controlled trials. And unlike the other papers, we were able to provide kind of like direct probability statements rather than these vague, um, uh, you know, these the, the strange confidence intervals, you know, sort of statements and risk ratios they were um, they were provided. And we found that there was a, you know, over a 90% probability that, I mean, well, this kind of like simplifies it, but over a 90% 90 probability that, that, that ivermectin would have a, a, a positive effect in reducing um, deaths. Now, even when we removed a couple of studies that were subsequently claimed to be fraudulent. There was a lot of controversy around this. The results were still quite ro robust with that. I mean, the probability dropped, I mean, about 84%, but it still provided pretty strong support for, you know, for ivermectin be being, being effective. And, and the thing is that um, even if it wasn't, even if, it, even if its positive effect was minimal, it is a very widely used drug it's, and it's got an incredibly you know, an incredibly good safety record right so it just does seem completely strange to us why there was this com campaign to absolutely close down any even any any menu you, know, you couldn't even you, i mean you know if if we if you mentioned that ivermectin might be um uh, a, a, a safe and effective treat early treatment for covid on on twitter you'll you'll, you'll get closed down you'll you'll get censored for it you know on, on all the social media platforms maybe even on youtube <laughs> yes so you might need to cut this bit out <laughs> we'll see how we, all i can do is we sim we simply report it on the available data yeah and why do you think there's been this closing down of um of that particularly uh, not just in the medical field but but possibly in the academic area as well well for the for, right for, for the medical i mean medically i mean of course you know the key influences let's say behind much of the covid narrative which of course includes especially the, the, the pharmaceutical companies, right? Um, who are massively profiting from, from, from the vaccines. They can't make any, any profit from you know, cheap generic drugs like, like Ivermectin. I think, and I think, I, think the company, I think the company who developed it, which was Merck, right? They of course no longer have a patent. So you know, it's not in their interest even to, you know, to push, the, push the drug. They, you know, it's, it's all about, you know, the, 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 <laughs> you know, there are no, you know, it's all about that they're making massive profits, you know, from from the vaccines. I mean, there are you know there are lots of early uh, treat you know early treatments which have there seems to be some reasonable empirical evidence for. I mean, even you know, again, I'm not a clinician here, so I'm, I'm openly admitting that this is outside of my 
area of expertise, but I think that there is, it does seem there's evidence that even taking vitamins like common, you know, C, D, zinc, as well as some of these in conjunction with some of these, you know, um, reasonably safe drugs like ivermectin or hydro hydroxychloroquine that at the very, you know, at the very least they're not harmful, but they actually may be doing a lot of good. I mean, we know, for example, that, you know, that having a low um, vitamin D count is certainly a, a very common feature, you know, of people who have died with um, COVID. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's a recent paper out on this very subject, I understand. Uh, yeah, so why not push, why not push the, you know, um, you know, those kinds of you know, cheap and, and and healthy options, you know, early treatments. Take take these vitamins. You know, it it, it could well be effective. I've certainly upped my intake of vitamin D up to the yeah. um, uh, the recommended nice um, uh, maximum level. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Vitamin. It just make it just makes sense. It, it really does. Yeah. Well, we're coming to, to the end of the the, the conversation, um, uh, Norman. But let me just ask you a, a couple of more general questions. One is about the academy, the, the role of the universities in uh, in this. How have uh, how have they um, measured up in your estimation in terms of the proper role of questioning and, and truth seeking in, in all of this matter? Have you had any experience of <laughs> any, any pushback in your areas? Where well, you, look, you know, I, I, I certainly have. Look, I think. But it, well, I hope actually, unless we're all closed, unless all of the dissenters are completely closed down before this happens, I think that in future years, people will look back on this time as one of total shame for academia. The very people in academia who should have been leading the charge to question what governments were telling us and to pursue the truth have actually been the ones most prominent in censoring any attempts to pursue the truth. I mean, it's been largely academics who push the government into the extreme restrictions and lockdowns. And often these academics are not even qualified in the relevant areas. And they don't provide any rigorous evidence for the recommendations they made. I mean, these include, um, for example, psychologists who are prominent in promoting the, what I regard as what was a psyops propaganda, the campaign of fear, which is well documented. It's in the you know minutes of the, uh, of the, of the SAGE meetings, et cetera, which were basically, you know, a campaign to force people to comply with increasingly harsh restrictions and infringements of civil liberties, and then to close down any any dissent against that. And the thing is, what's, what's even more, what worries me as well about this, but maybe justifies it, I mean, the, these academics are completely unaffected by the negative consequences of their recommendations. They've got no skin in the game. So in contrast to independent workers, small business owners who lose their whole livelihoods, not one of these academics lost a single day's work or pay. I mean, in fact, most of them, for most of them, their lives are made easier by being able to work you know, from home because mostly they're a privileged elite, they've got large homes and gardens, and it's the poorest in society. It's the ones that, you know, you expect academics, you know, with that sort of liberal mindset, the ones that you know supposed to be defending, you know, they, they expect those to, you know, still stack, stack shelves and deliver stuff to the homes of the academics. And, and they're the ones, you know, who are, you know, it's those people who suffer most from the restrictions and lockdowns, the poorest in society. They're the ones who take the brunt of it. And the, the, I tell you, the irony also is that the only time the academics, or at least the academics who've got any kind of like government or media influence, the only time those people have voiced strong concerns is when the government wasn't prepared to go as far as they were recommending with respect to the most stringent restrictions and lockdowns. So, you know, when the government says, oh, we're, you know, we're going to ease some restrictions, these academics come out and say, no, no, you mustn't do it. You know, we've got to keep these restrictions. We've got to have more restrictions, you know. It, you know, the, it's the it's not, academia is totally enough or fast enough. Yes, I, I, we, <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, they've, to to, they've totally abandoned all the principles for which academia was traditionally renowned. So in in, instead of challenging the ruling elites, they have they've become a core component of the ruling elite. Right. And what about yourself personally? Have you had any, I mean, you're one of the most outspoken of the academics left who, who, yeah. who says something contrary to what the narrative is, but have you had any personal pushback against uh, your results or papers? Yeah, or yeah. I, I have been, I mean, just have to look at, I mean, I, 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 I've actually now muted Lots of people. I, don't, I never block people on, on, on Twitter, for example. I mute them because I, 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 I because I'm so regularly sort of defamed there, and you know 
with the most horrible things. I mean, I'm, I'm general, I'm, I've been publicly defamed and shunned by other academics. You can see yeah. responses, for example, on Twitter that. And obviously I've, I've been insulted. I've been called a pusher of fake news and misinformation. People are continually called for my dismissal from Queen Mary on Twitter. And I've been censored and not just on social media, but by the academic publishing community. I mean, because my research group specializes in quantitative risk assessment, you know, using these sort of causal Bayesian models. And because I was the principal investigator on a major interdisciplinary project, interdisciplinary project dedicated to using our method, modeling methods to improve medical decision-making, it was inevitable that I would be drawn into the analysis of COVID data when the crisis started in early 2020. And, you know, as I sort of indicated before, in those first few months, we published several papers in peer-reviewed journals that applied our modeling techniques into a range of statistical issues, you know, associated with infection rates, etc. But the work wasn't considered controversial then because it didn't challenge the official narrative. And I was invited to speak at many seminars about that work, etc. But as soon as we started to do research on, for example, the implications of flawed PCR testing and the problems about counting case numbers based on that, everything changed. And obviously, our recent work on things like ivermectin and vaccines has just made things, you know, a whole level worse. And with, with maybe one minor exception, none of my most 12 recently co-authored um, reports on, on, on COVID have been accepted for publication. In fact, every one has been rejected without review, something which I've rarely ever encountered before. And what's especially disturbing is that the two relevant, re there are two preprint servers called Archive and MedArchive, which are, yeah. which are most relevant for this area of work. They've also stopped accepting our papers. And those servers were specifically set up to enable anybody, any researchers. But they're not peer reviewed. They're, they're not peer reviewed. They're, they're, anyone. they're supposed to be, that's the whole point. They're supposed to, you're supposed to be able to, to deposit work there without peer review. Um, you know, to get feedback from, as long as it's within scope and it's not fraudulent or breaking any laws, you know, they accept anything, but not our work. That's astonishing. I haven't heard that before. My last question for, for you, Norman, is um, from where we are at the present time facing, I suppose, the tail end of this um, pandemic, what advice would you have for government or government ministers um, as to how they should proceed from this point on. What should they be doing and what should they not be doing? Uh, well, they should remove all the, COVID, all the emergency COVID powers and return to what was considered normal for decades before, including flu uh, epidemics. And that means no COVID testing, but encourage personal responsibility, whereby people who are unwell with COVID symptoms should avoid work and travel and be supported in, in that. And I think they should provide the kind of treatment packages that they actually provide in India for those, you know, with the sort of the vitamins and these, you know, these, these safe drugs for, you know, for early treatment for people who develop the symptoms um, early. Now, they should also allow people to make their own informed choice on vaccinations. They should be publishing accurate data on the safety and effectiveness for different age groups, as I've indicated, so, as, you know, so that they can, we, it enables informed decision. And they should drop all regulations everywhere related to COVID passes and masks. Now, I mean, just finally, I, while I believe, I believe in limited government, generally, I'm not a fan of taxpayer funded health campaigns. But if they're going to spend money on health campaigns, then, you know, promote healthy eating, including, you know, vitamin supplements, supplements and exercise, which, you know, which, of course, reduce the risk of many diseases, including COVID. Professor Norman Fenton, thank you ever so much for your time and also for a very interesting conversation today. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me on. Bye. Bye.